on the first thing I want to talk about with uh, discovering learning techniques is that there's a, not a one size fits all approach to what we're doing. And this is really important to understand that when we're presenting information to learners, whether that be an adult, a child, youth, uh, whoever it happens to be, when we're presenting information to them, we want to ensure that we uh, don't approach this with sort of a one size fits all mentality. And that understanding that different learners are going to learn differently. So one of the things that I'm going to start off by saying, and I understand that by starting off with this, it's gonna come across as controversial, but one of the pieces that I'm going to share with you is there, there's a concept out there about people having different types of learning techniques that they appreciate versus, and what I mean by that is that uh, we have this mindset or we've been told that there is uh, auditory learners, kinesthetic learners, visual learners, and what have you. Uh, there is significant research to showcase that there is no validity to that sort of mindset. Uh, it has been perpetuated in a lot of different learning environments, but uh, modern research has actually shown that learners, when they were given tasks to learn in their chosen sort of field, where they said they're an auditory learner, visual learner, kinesthetic learner, were able to learn in their chosen mind, chosen sort of learning ability and then retest and then given another task and tested in a different learning theory, there was almost no difference that occurred in the learning. So uh, this has been showcased multiple times in society. If you're interested in reading a book about it, uh, Peter, I'm gonna say Peter Brown possibly, I could be getting that wrong, but Peter Brown, the title of the book anyways is called Make It Stick. Um, and if you wanna read more about it, that's one of the books that talks about it, but there is tons of research to back this up. So with that said, please understand, however, that not one size fits all. So I understand that I just said that there is no sort of difference between learning between kinesthetic, visual, audio, that type of learning. However, each individual person is still going to have different things that they are gonna to need to either work on in their game or different motivations and different pieces as to what is sort of interesting to them with, with what's going on, right? now. With that said, I'm going to go to my next slide here. So we need to understand our athlete motivations or our learner motivations. So it says right here, it says right on the slide there, motivations are different and we need to understand the why. We need to understand the why of the learner. This is hugely important and this is vastly important for contributing to that one piece, uh, one size fits all type of learning mentality and how it doesn't uh, it doesn't really work that way, right? Excuse me. So uh, some players are going to be playing the game for fun. Some players are going to be learning the game to uh, for a more serious sort of level of play. And those, as a result of those, even just those two individual types of motivations, how we communicate information is going to be drastically different. So different motivations will affect the kind of feedback that you get from the players or the learners you're working with, and this in turn will shape how you coach each player individually, okay? So this is really important for building, uh, for building the with your learner. You need to understand their motivation. If they're there as a recreational player or just somebody who wants to get out and be physically active, and you're trying to uh, train them or teach them as if they're going to be on a pro tour someday, the, they're going, there's going to be gaps, there's going to be frustrations, it's not going to work out for you as well as a coach, and it's not going to work out as well for them as a learner. All right, so just try to absolutely understand your motivation. The best way to do this is to ask questions, ask people, ask the learners what their motivation is, let them use their own words to explain that to you, okay? This is hugely important. Um, I actually published the book, uh, just within the last few months, it's called Preparing for Performance. The entire first chapter of the book deals with the coach-athlete relationship and then builds on the coach-athlete relationship as a foundation for uh, successful instruction. And uh, within the book, I go on to talk about what it's like to coach uh, Olympic and professional athletes um, and how that coach-athlete relationship is vastly 
uh, important. So I got a question coming up here and I saw the question that says, what drills would you recommend to make it fun? I'm gonna get to that in one second here. Thanks for that question, Christian. So uh, the, the three pieces that I'm gonna to touch on tonight, specifically when we talk about constraints-led learning are gonna be task constraints, environmental constraints and performer constraints. So those are three different aspects that uh, a coach can sort of manipulate. Uh, I'll give us a clarifier. You can't really modify performer constraints because it's based on the individual performer, um, but you can work with that individual performer to work on the constraints that they have as an individual. The other two, the task constraints and environmental constraints, you can absolutely manipulate and I'm gonna give you some games on uh, how to utilize those. So if we move forward, so task constraints learning. So task constraints relate to the activity that the learner is engaging with in terms of the goal, rules, or equipment, okay? So if we are utilizing a task constraint, this is related specifically to the sport of disc golf. It it's going to have to do likely with the disc, it's going to likely have to do with the basket or some variation of the rules within the sport of disc golf is what we're going to be manipul manipulating within this situation, okay? So an example of what that would look like if we were to utilize this in a training session. So an example of a task constraint in relation to disc golf would be a player uh, is told to throw a disc and land it within a certain radius. So if you remember, uh, for those of you who watched previously, we went over uh, random practice versus block practice. And within the uh, sort of random practice environment, I, saw, I showed a picture with uh, somebody teeing off and having them stand at the tee area and then throwing to different distances. Okay, so within that, what you could do is actually maybe you could lay out a put down cones or even just mark it out sort of mentally in your own mind. And you could put down and say, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to land within that radius. Now, you could potentially use the, the basket uh, for this, uh, depending on your perspective. Your perspective is that you'd like, if you're throwing it as an approach shot, or if you're throwing uh, from the tee and just wanting to get it within circle one or within circle two, intentionally, then you can absolutely use the tee pad to the basket sort of as a constraint piece if it's on a course where you're able to throw from the tee pad to the basket, right? An example for people in uh, Calgary, uh, let me think about this now, whole, former hole three at Baker, uh, if you were to throw from the tee pad, it was an island green, right? It basically was a circle one, almost island green at Baker, where you could uh, have it land inside the circle. So it was on that one was an island green, but it's essentially that sort of idea where you're having a, a space to land it in. Now, an example of how you could how you could take that into a game situation. So to answer uh, Christian's question here, what drills would you recommend to make it fun? Use tic-tac-toe. So if you were to, you could either play this by yourself uh, or with somebody else, you could set out a, maybe a tic-tac-toe grid uh, using cones or shoes or bags, additional discs, whatever you happen to do is choose a, make a tic-tac-toe grid. And then you're going to try to land your disc into the various parts of a tic-tac-toe grid and score uh, and score that way. So you're trying to make your line that way, if that makes sense. So you have your, your tic-tac-toe grid, and then you're going to say, okay, I need to land in the top right corner to, that's where I wanna land. So you throw your disc and try to land it in that top right corner. If you don't land it in the top right corner, maybe you land it in the space below on the middle right side, that's now where your disc is. You're gonna to have to try to figure out where you're gonna, how you're gonna make your, your lines of tic-tac-toe from there. So that's an option that you can do from there as a game format for it. If you want to do it in more of a serious type of format, like you said, uh, you could use a target and mark out sort of circle one and circle two. I do believe that if you utilize your UDISC app, if you don't, if you don't have UDISC, I would highly recommend that you download the UDISC app. If you do have the UDISC app, if you scroll, uh, open up the app, I'm gonna do it here with together with you. You'll open up the app. In the bottom right corner, there's three dots. If you click on that, you can, it'll open up a, a screen that taught, it gives you scorecards, players, all that kind of stuff. About halfway down, there's something called accuracy practice. You can click on accuracy practice, and there's actually a short, medium, long, and custom setting that you can set up to practice. And that would be a way that you could use a task constraint style of learning 
uh, with uh, within your practice setting. Now, I will give you a caveat that it is sort of set up to do a block style practice rather than a random style practice, but that is uh, easy to adjust. And you guys, because you were at the last session, understand the difference between random block practice, and you guys can then go ahead and adjust. But there is a format that you can use on UDISC that'll record it for you um, and be able to do that. So uh, that's one option that you can use for, for your task constraints. Then if we move on to environmental constraints. So environmental constraints deal with the characteristic of the environment that can influence the activity level of a task when it is performed in that environment, right? So it's pretty self-explanatory. The type of environment that you're participating within is going to affect how you play the game, right? So this could be a variety of different things. So given an example here, an example of a task constraint in relation to disc golf would be difficult obstacles placed in strategic places around the course to disturb the natural flight path of a disc, right? So we could intentionally set up obstacles on the course to sort of get in the way. And then now you're having to force a player to maybe throw different lines. Now, another way of going about that is a game that is called Mando. Uh, and I have all these games uh, in a book format, excuse me, that I put together. But the, the basic concept behind Mando is that every single throw that you make, you've creating, you're creating mandatories in your mind, right? So you're not actually going and attaching mandatory signs on trees or obstacles around the course, but you're creating them in your mind. So you could be even you're standing on the tee pad and you're looking and going, great, for this hole, I need to throw to the right of that tree or to the left of this tree, or I need to throw over that, or I need to throw around that. Right, so there's a variety of different ways you can do that. And do it for every single throw that you make while you're playing that round, okay? So this isn't just off the tee, this is for every single throw. So you make your, you make your throw, either you did or you didn't make the mandatory, you can choose what to do from there. So if you throw and you didn't make the mandatory, that's okay, don't, you don't have to pick up your disc and walk to a designated drop zone. This isn't league play, this is learning, this is development. Take your disc from where it lies, and then in your mind, create another obstacle for you to go around on a way to get there, right? So just walk up to where it is and say, okay, from here to the basket and create yourself another Mando that's maybe gonna force you to have to go backhand or maybe it's gonna have to be uh, an Anheuser flex shot or maybe it's gonna have to be a roller or whatever it happens to be. And for each throw that you make until you get to circle one, circle two, depending on how you feel comfortable with that, um, make a mandatory. Now, if you want to within circle two, make a mandatory, that's totally your choice. You're more than welcome to do that. Uh, but for the most part, most people learning and learning and playing to practice, they are going to be just using the mandatories from the tee pad to about circle two. Okay. And be creative with this. The more that you challenge yourself, the better you are going to be in the longer run, right? So we talked about this again in one of the other videos that we did. The difference between skill retention, skill acquisition, and skill on demand, right? So it's going to seem frustrating at the beginning. It's going to seem that you maybe that you aren't learning in the current exact context because it's going to be hard to quantify it and see like, oh man, I really struggled with that, right? That's okay. Keep doing this. And it's again, it's it's adhering to that randomness style of training, right? So it's not just every single time you're throwing, you're throwing a forehand, you're throwing a forehand. No, change it up, throw a forehand, throw a backhand, throw a thumber, throw a roller, throw the various different types of throws. Or if, again, we're dealing with coach the coach, ask your athletes to do those. So if you are working with athletes, you can say, okay, on this hole, I want this tree to be the mando off the tree. And then maybe on the approach shot, I want that to be the mando, right? And you could mark those out really easy to be able to mark these things out. You can uh, tie a flagging tape around trees if you want to do those things. Just even just put a cone at the base of a tree and say all the trees that have cones at the base of them, you need to go either to the left or the right of them. Uh, and that sort of thing. So we have a question here from John. Any special considerations or modified approaches for coaching older players, middle-aged or older? Good question. Uh, what I would suggest primarily is uh, to do standstill uh, for that type of thing. So making sure that the more that you have, uh, if you're, this is specifically related to your, your question, John, with regards to approach shots, um, to have it more of a standstill because you're removing variables from it. 
and you're able to be able to control more. Now, there might be the argument that you're like, oh, but we're older players, I won't be able to get as much power behind it. Absolutely understand that. However, accuracy is much more power or much more valuable than power, right? So uh, I would include that type of thing within your, within your play, within your training. And then a follow-up here question, how about women and kids? Uh, absolutely, sort of the same, sort of the same piece here is when you're doing these things, these, these games that I'm presenting can be used for people of any age within your, within your ability. If you need to adjust, adjust. So if you're, if you're working with younger age players and they can't throw as far, take that into consideration and adjust the distances that you're working with on them, right? So you're not going to have them stand at uh, whatever it is on the, what is it? on the whole 10 at DRM as an example in Calgary and try to have them get as close to the basket as they can if we're dealing with youth players, right? Um, I mean, some youth players can bomb and that's great or some women players can bomb and that's great, but use different different pieces within that, right? So make, make challenges for yourself that are relatable to the athletes that you're working with. So if you have to shorten those distances, shorten those distances, right? If you have to change the par on a hole, change the par on a hole, right? You could completely remove the par in a hole as well if you're doing these types of learning. So if you're doing uh, an environmental constraint learning or a task constraint learning environment, when you're working with the athletes, it might be almost, it might be very, very difficult for someone to achieve, say, a par three on a hole. That's totally okay. Remove that and say the object is to, we're trying to get you to work on different throws. If you make it there in five throws or six throws, that's totally okay, right? So understanding that those pieces uh, can be adjusted. And then again, this is talking, making sure that you've talked with your athlete and understanding the motivation part beforehand as well. So great questions, guys. These are really good questions. So uh, number part three here with, with regards to discovering learning techniques is performer constraints. Now, this is one that a coach doesn't per se have the same influence over, but can work together with the athlete. And again, this is really important why the coach athlete relationship is important. And I understand that some of you are watching maybe working one on one or in smaller groups. And some of you who are uh, watching this may be working with like a large school group, you're in a phys ed situation, and you're like, I've got 28 kids, I'm not going to sit down with every single one of my kids and understand their each individual personal needs and have a 20 minute conversation with them before we start a training session. I completely understand that. I coach collegiate soccer for several years. I've got a roster of 24 athletes before every single practice session. I'm not having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with every single athlete that I'm working with. I totally understand that. Okay. It is possible to have a really short conversation and understand why somebody's there. Even in how somebody is participating or practicing as a coach, sometimes you can deduce those things. I'd be cautious to, of those because we can't know somebody's intentions uh, generally unless we ask them because they could just be fooling around and be actually wanting to play serious, but they're just having maybe had a crappy day or, or whatever it happens to be. So generally, if you can ask, with regards to performer constraints, you can, some of them are very simple in that if you have a very tall athlete, they are going to move and throw and make different choices as a shorter athlete, right? So again, this also plays into the questions that have been asked in the chat group. What about for women? What about for youth? What about for older players? The choices that you're going to make based on you individually as a performer, or if you are a coach, the, the athlete that you're working with, if you're working with an older athlete, I'm probably not going to ask them to throw a thumber because generally older athletes have shoulder issues and struggle with that movement. And it's also a lot more taxing on the shoulder than to throw a different style of throw. So I'm generally not going to ask older athletes to throw that type of throw, right? By the same token, I might have uh, younger athletes or other athletes that can't throw as far, and that is totally okay. We will use the other strengths in their game. Right. So, uh, I mean, I played around this afternoon and I'm standing on the tee box and it was fairly windy outside. I mean, it was plus six, but it was fairly windy. It's part of being in the prairies and I'm standing at the tee pad. Uh, I'm playing with a friend of mine who is a very good ultimate player. He's played, uh, in four different world championships for team Canada and ultimate. And he stands at the tee pad and we, there was a, there was, uh, actually what we talked about, uh, an environmental constraint. 
there was a mandal uh, about 300 feet down the fairway. Uh, and so he steps up to the tee pad, he throws forehand and he curves it around the, and plays it perfectly. Perfect shot around the mandal. It was great. It was amazing to watch. I'm so glad he executed it the way he planned it. I step up and I go, you know what? I know that I have an okay forehand, but on really windy days, I don't throw well into a, a headwind with my forehand. And so as a result, I am going to choose to play a more of a placement shot. I'm going to choose to take a mid-range off the tee, throw it towards the uh, mandal that's down the fairway. That's going to set me up for my second shot to allow me to have a really good throw to get around it and, and move up, right? Uh, there's another hole here we have in, uh, here in Winnipeg here, uh, hole six at La Barrier Park in, in Winnipeg. Uh, it is a very 90 degree right-hand turn. Um, you can try to throw like a big, if you're right-handed, try to throw a big forehand spike hyzer. Uh, and get there. And I believe uh, Brian Freeze has done so when at Eagle the Hole, it's a par four. However, what most people do is choose to throw a backhand, get to the entranceway of the tunnel, and then play down the tunnel. And so using your abilities and understanding where you're at um, and where your athletes are at, and then using those tools, right? So if you have an athlete who's a former baseball player, maybe they're really good at throwing at throwing thumbers or throwing tomahawks. And that is totally okay. Use that as part of their game, right? If you have an athlete, if you have younger athletes or athletes that can't throw as far, that's okay. Uh, I've talked about this on a blog post or sorry, not a blog post, an Instagram post probably about a year ago and the importance of course management. And it doesn't matter if you can throw really, really far if you don't have good course management. And so this is going out to uh, answer some of the questions that were posted with older athletes, younger athletes, or maybe athletes that um, can't throw as far or what have you. Course management is vastly important. And if you manage your course well, if you manage your throws well, then you can be really, really successful in understanding that these are the shots that would make the most sense for me to play and playing those shots rather than trying to go, oh, I'm just going to try I'm going to try to throw it as far as I can. Again, with that said, adjust as needed. Uh, I was just talking to, with about this to, with somebody on this about on the whew, back that up. I was just talking to somebody about this on the weekend. Is a new player here in Winnipeg, and he is wanting to throw from the long tees uh, at one of our local courses. I suggested to him that he might be better off throwing from the shorter tees until he learns a little bit. And explain to him that I did when I was learning, I played from the short tees for about the first six to eight months of my training before I backed up to the longer tees. And again, there is nothing wrong with that. I please don't label tees by gender as the long tees for men and the short tees for women. That is not how this goes in the sport. Okay. Understand that there's short tees and there's long tees. They offer different styles of throws. I just played the short tees on that course yesterday right? Because it offers a different style of throwing, a different type of learning and a different opportunity to develop as a player than just trying to go to the long tees and throw from the long tees every time, right? And just as needed to, to have the most enjoyable practice session or training session that you can have with, with your athletes. So uh, performance constraints try to help the learners find the, the most uh, suitable situations that are specific to them and their aspect of the game. And so um, examples of this type of throw, uh, sorry, examples, the type of throw or movements, uh, solutions that would be most suitable every, every, for a very short player, maybe different from that of a very tall player. Okay. So uh, that's totally understandable that that makes sense. And then as a coach, you can work with those types of things, right? Uh, and this applies to like what it talks about here, this can apply to physical, it can apply to functional, emotional, psychological aspects of the game. Some players are going to be very strong mentally. Other players are going to need to work on their mental game. So whatever we need to do to be able to work on those pieces with our athletes. So a couple of important notes, and I sort of started with this, but I'm going to highlight it again. So important note one for, for this is not my words, and I specifically didn't, I specifically quoted it. Um, these are from uh, some of the notes that I was uh, taking today in preparation for this. So for thorough 
sustainable learning. Learners need to feel challenged, even frustrated by the techniques they are using to learn the material. Learning is deeper and more durable when it is effortful. However, it's counterintuitive that we may feel. However counterintuitive that may feel. So again, this is going to speak to that random versus block practice training style, right? And if you remember some of the other pieces, we, I gave you two graphs uh, a couple of weeks ago or a week ago, whatever it was, talking about um, the flow state model and the challenge point framework. This speaks to that same topic and that there needs to be an ideal challenge for the athlete and even maybe push them a little bit. If something is too easy, the athlete's not going to develop. There actually has to be a challenge for the athletes, right? So making sure that we're challenging and motivating, excuse me, the athletes that we're working with through through challenge. And it's okay to even, like I said, it's, it's okay to even be a little bit frustrated. That's totally okay. Now, the next piece to this, again, this is going to lead into the topic that we're going to be talking about on Thursday, is have learners solve a problem before being taught the solution is more effective than learning the solution first, even when the learners make mistakes and fail. So again, I've, I just published a book uh, a few months ago, one of the pieces that I wrote about was making mistakes and intentionally making mistakes because it's through your mistakes that learning occurs. And I think I've mentioned that to you before, but really important. And this is what I one of the things that I'm going to want you to have as a takeaway from today is provide tools and provide problems and allow your athletes or allow your learners to find the solutions. Do not tell them the solution to the problem. You're actually doing them a disservice by doing so. And this is why when you see what we, when I present on the next session that I talk about is that what we're going to do is we're going to play the game of disc golf and then allow the game of disc golf to be the learning tool. And then from that, we're going to say, what did athletes struggle with? And then we're going to build a practice session from there. I'm not going to, I don't approach. And this is, again, this is coming from working with collegiate and professional athletes. I don't build my training sessions very specifically and say, this is what I'm going to work on today. I have plans and ideas, what I want to work on with my athletes, but I actually allow the game to dictate what we're going to work on with the athletes, because it's the best way for the action athlete or the learner to actually learn. Right. And so what this means is do not give your athletes solutions to problems. You're doing them a huge disservice by doing so. So provide tools for them different options for how they could possibly solve a problem, provide problems for them, and then allow them to find solutions to that problem on their own. And you will be amazed. They will probably come up with some solutions that you have never even thought of. And this is especially awesome in working with youth because they are so creatively minded. They come up with solutions that our adult brain sometimes doesn't allow because we, as we age, we kind of tend to create more boxes, uh, but the youth have a little bit more creativity to their mindset. And they sometimes come up with really amazing solutions that work, right? So I just wanted to encourage that piece there. So I, I realized it's 8.30. I just wanted to post this up here and so and ask if there was any more questions. Uh, there's been some really good questions that have been posted in the chat. But if there's anybody else that has questions, again, you can feel free to uh, comment in the chat. Uh, and I will try to respond. Even if it's not live, I will try to respond later for that. Or you could shoot me a message and I will, I will try to respond to it. We do have a part two coming up. And so if there is questions that didn't get addressed today, I will try to answer them in the part two. Part two will be explaining more what the actual tr training session looks like. So we're going to go through five different sort of steps of delivering a training session for, um, for the coach. I thank you guys for watching the coach the coach part one and I look forward to part two with you uh, later on this week.